What is cracking, everybody? It's Mega Pie Man here with another Jumpstart interview. Today's interview is going to be a little bit different because today I'm going to be interviewing Maxwell Adams, TV show creator who has worked on shows such as Cartoon Network's The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, as well as Disney's Fish Hooks. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what it is you do, Max? Uh, sure. Yeah, my, my name is Maxwell Adams, and I make cartoons for a living. Uh, and that means a lot of different things. It's a lot of, uh, when I'm lucky, it's a lot of writing and a lot of drawing. When I'm unlucky, it's a lot of uh, management and, and paperwork. <laughs> so it's a little bit of everything. So today we're going to be talking about your Kickstarter for your brand new project, Dead Meat. What exactly is Dead Meat? Uh, Dead Meat is a post-apocalyptic puppet comedy uh, web series uh, featuring a mutant hunter, his dog, and the woman that comes between them. Sounds like a very interesting combination of characters and settings. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. There's, there's nothing quite like it out there right now, so here's to hoping. About how much money are you looking to raise for your Kickstarter campaign? Uh, we're trying to get $50,000, and to you and me, that's a lot of money, but for uh, TV production, it's pretty low. <laughs> now, this is the first project you've tried to work on by yourself. Before this, you've always worked with uh, a company or um, some sort of channel. Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as the stuff that people have actually seen, I feel like uh, part of the impetus for doing this is that I'm always working on... A bunch of stuff in the background and you know over the years there have been dozens of show ideas and things that just get put on hold or flushed down the toilet and uh, I sort of feel like if I'm gonna do this stuff I want to start getting more more stories done and more more things out to the people so this is the first big attempt at that mm -hmm, that's very understandable now everything that I know from you about they're all 2d cartoons what was the decision to go and make dead meat puppets, which is a very different medium than your normal 2D animation. It is, uh, but I feel like for me it sort of straddles the line between cartoons and reality. Uh, I was lucky enough to work with uh, some puppets and puppeteers uh, a couple times on Billy and Mandy. Uh, we had some puppet made, puppets made of the characters and they appeared in a few episodes. Uh, but for me, I've always loved puppets since way back when I was a kid and I'd watch The Muppets and Sesame Street and The Dark Crystal and all that. Uh, and I thought it would be fun to have sort of a sort of crazy R-rated take on that. Now, some of the stuff that you've made kind of has a, I guess you would say, an interesting theme around it with shows like The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy and Evil Con Carne. Now, what are some of the inspirations that you've either taken from those or for yourself that you're going to work with with Dead Meat? Uh, I think... As far as like Billy and Mandy went, uh, a lot of that came from uh, just my childhood obsession and fear of monsters. Uh, I used to love to watch Godzilla before I'd go to bed, but it would just freak me out and my parents would have to sit there. I had this love-hate relationship, and when I was a kid, I did this uh, sort of comic strip that was, I was really into Dungeons and Dragons, and I, I had no idea really how to play it. I just liked all the, the pictures in the book, but <laughs> I had this sort of idea that it was, you know, going to be the this team of heroes but they were all you know like the skeleton and the goblin and stuff like that mm -hmm. and i think that sort of fed in some ways directly into billy and mandy billy and mandy was sort of all uh about finding ways to laugh at all the dumb stuff that you know i was afraid of as a kid mm -hmm. that's a very interesting way of dealing with that kind of instead of just being afraid of stuff kind of facing it head on and trying to make fun of it yeah and i think you know good stuff can come out of you know, sort of these internal conflicts that people have. And that was that's sort of what's behind Dead Meat as well. Like, uh, I grew up sort of in the shadow of NORAD. So, like, every night as a kid, I just thought, oh, good, get the Russians are going to come and blow us all up. Uh, so, you know, that led to, you know, that sort of fed into Dead Meat a little bit too. And, like, basically the world of Dead Meat is just sort of everything awful about the world of adults. <laughs> so it's, it's in its own way, it's trying to find ways to laugh at that stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, you've mentioned that this is going to be a R-rated uh, thing. I th believe that this is going to be a web series instead of actually be on TV. What was the right. decision to go all out and make it R-rated as well as make it a web series instead of putting it out on DVD or trying to find some channel that you could put it on? 
Uh, and well, you know, if everything goes really well, maybe it will end up on DVD someday. But <laughs> uh, I sort of feel like when you're pitching to a network, you're you're really sort of married to their brand, whatever that is. So anything you do is never really going to be 100% what you want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so with something like Dead Meat that I feel is like so sort of bizarre and out there, uh, something like that would be very, very hard to sell to a network. Uh, you know, it's not animation, it's it's puppets, and how marketable is that? It's it's going to be a big fight to get that made. So I figured I would just go uh, right to the people that seem to like what I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's pretty interesting to learn, because since you've worked in TV before, the fact that you would go to crowdsourcing instead of something like, I don't know, Adult Swim or even Comedy Central, who's had public comedy shows before, such as shows like Crank Yankers, to make it a web series instead of a TV show, movie, or special is definitely a different decision to go with. Yeah, I've for years people uh, have been asking me at you know Comic Con and stuff like, what would I recommend to someone trying to get into animation or into entertainment? And I always say, well, yeah, just start building a following on the internet, get on, get stuff out there for people to see, and. I realized at one point, like, I wasn't really doing that myself. <laughs> I was just sort of totally reliant on all these networks. And at some point, uh, like, it's just, uh, like I said, it's it's about getting the work out more frequently into to more people. And I feel like when you're dealing with a network, uh, you know, I was at Disney for about five years. And that entire time, I had one project just tied up in development. Mm. And I don't really want to go through that again, so... I would much rather just sort of forge my own path. That's very understandable, very understandable. Now, you've mentioned some of the inspirations behind the shows you've had in the past, but what is it that really made you decide that you wanted to go into creating shows in the first place? I don't know if you've gone into animating the shows, but I definitely know that you've worked with creating them and writing them, but what is it that really pushed you into doing that in what was, I guess, for lack of a better word, your trek from just saying, I want to make shows, to actually creating the TV shows? Uh, and I wish it were a deeper story than that, but uh, essentially, like, ever since I can remember, like, my sister and I would wake up... Uh, you know, go downstairs and watch cartoons till our eyes bled. That was all of elementary school. And uh, I just kept loving and watching cartoons all through high school. I uh, I had a friend who went to high school with me who's out here and also works in animation. But we were both like, yeah, this is what we're going to do. And I went off to college and I studied animation and I got an internship and I came out here and I didn't ever think that I would, you know, do anything else. And it wasn't until you know, maybe a year or two ago when I looked back and thought, wow, that could have gone so horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so we know you for a couple of shows such as The Grim and Evil Con Carne and Fish Hooks, but is there anything else that you've worked on that we, that those uh, people who know who you are, um, I myself who's followed most of the stuff that I, I that I know that you have been part of is there anything that you've been in that you think that most people don't know about or something that you're specifically proud that you were part of but it's not really that popular or anything else that you have done besides the main stuff that most people would know you about um, for uh yeah like I, I've had a lot of different sort of jobs and different roles on different shows uh, even Fish Hooks was very different from Billy and Mandy and Evil Incarnate because it wasn't my own thing. But uh, I think one of the things I'm proudest of from the early days and certainly the the place that I grew the most was uh, Cow and Chicken back uh, at the end of Hanna-Barbera slash beginning of Cartoon Network. Mm -hmm. uh, you were I think actually I went... part of that show? I didn't realize that you were part of that show. Yeah, I... Uh, I started out doing, I, I had briefly worked at uh, Film Roman, which is the place that does The Simpsons, King of the Hill, uh, and then I sort of floated around for a little bit, ended up at uh, Hanna-Barbera, and I was doing props on Cow and Chicken, and I worked my way up to characters, and from there I got onto boards, and one of the boards I did, uh, the Cartoon Network executives took notice and came and sought me out for development. By boards, you mean storyboards, correct? Yes. All right, just wanted to clarify that. So, being able to now have the freedom to do whatever you want with Dead Meat, is there anything that you've wanted to do on previous shows that you just weren't able to do due to censoring? And how was it dealing with the fact that you had to write around 
um, the specific companies that you were working with? Uh, it depends on the company. I feel like Cartoon Network was very forgiving in a lot of ways. And, you know, there, there's always like the dumb standards rules where it's like, well, you can't have broken glass and stuff like that gets really frustrating because, you know, in real life, there could be broken glass everywhere, mm -hmm. but you can't show it in a cartoon because somebody got afraid of broken glass at one time or another. Uh, so it's usually the just the dumb sort of niggly little stuff like that that makes things difficult. But uh, for the most part, like you know where the boundaries are, and you kind of know when you're getting close to those boundaries and how far you can push. And you know they'll tell you if they if if it's not cool. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there hasn't really been anything that I I was super disappointed that we didn't get to do. I feel like most of the time I, I was able to find a compromise. Right. Now I was asking this because Grimm was a show that really it it didn't superly push boundaries, but it definitely went places that other shows either wouldn't or other companies wouldn't be comfortable going. Yeah, I always say that uh, because of the sort of the black comedy angle, that's the one thing that they didn't really have any context for so like that's where i feel like we really got kind of got away with things because you know they they already had all their rules in place for burps and farts and stuff like that and and you sort of knew when you were running up against a wall but if you just did some something sort of dark and creepy and weird they didn't really have any <laughs> standards set in place for that a little bit of a loophole yeah <laughs> So why don't you tell us a little bit more about Dead Meat? You've said that, that we do have our main characters and sort of a love interest. Who are the main characters behind this show? What exactly is going on in it that you have up to this point? I don't know necessarily how much you have created, how much you have written. I saw your Kickstarter video in which you showed a few second clip of something. I don't necessarily know if it was just a <laughs> prototype or what, but could you give us a bit more insight into what the people that are going to be for the show, the characters, and what exactly will be kind of happening in the show. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, all the stuff I did for the Kickstarter video is just stuff I did myself, and it all is, you know, it's tests, but it's also stuff that I'm hoping will, some of it will carry over, like I built out those cars, so those will actually be used in the production. But uh, the characters are, uh, there's a few main ones. There's Heck, who is a... Uh, James Heckler is his name. He's a mutant hunter. And in this world, mutants are shot on sight, so that's how he makes his living. He trades mutant heads for toilet paper, which is so rare and precious that it's now used as currency. <laughs> um, and he's got a dog, and they drive around in the wasteland together. Uh, but his dog, the big secret is his dog is also a mutant. So they sort of have this strained relationship. The poor dog has to you know, live in this bus and can't really go outside. Uh, and you know, he so loves his master that you know he would be more than happy just to become a mutant hunter himself and he doesn't quite understand that's not a good idea and into this mix comes the battle priestess suzuki jackson who is sort of the this big bad uh, mutant war priestess who is prophesied to unite the mutants against what's left of humanity and wipe out the human race so of course everybody's after her the What's left of humanity has sort of hired all the mutant hunters and has their own people out hunting her down. They've even allowed a few other mutants to go after her. Uh, so it's sort of this big uh, chase seeking her out. Uh, and there's one other sort of main character that plays into it, and that's Claude, who is Heck's sort of arch rival. And he works for the Church of the Conglomerate, which is sort of this big... It's the man, basically. It's uh, sort of all the... What was what was left of human authority sort of just melded into this big sort of religious corporate mess. But uh, they they all sort of represent, I guess, different sides of, of my own personality and thought process on all these horrible things that are happening in their world. Well, it, it definitely sounds like an interesting cast of characters. Yeah, should be fun. Should be fun. So you've created a couple shows right about now, and you've created a lot of characters within your show. Could you take us through the creative process? So this is maybe, maybe a brief overview of the creative process that you have when you're coming up with an idea for a show, when you're coming up with characters, and how you decide this character makes in, but this character does not. Uh, there's, there's sort of just this stew going on in my brain all the time where I'm just sort of playing out scenarios and thinking of story ideas and... Every now and then there gets to be too many and they all sort of fuse and disappear and spring off in sort of different directions. And 
I was talking about this with a, a friend today because I'm starting a new job soon, but uh, it's sort of like I, I can sit down and I can draw and I can write and eventually something will come up and all of that. Now, there's been a lot of things based around the post-apocalypse with zombies, mutants, and that sort of theme. It's become very popular these days. What do you feel sets Dead Meat apart from those other projects that use that theme and helps make Dead Meat unique? Uh, well, I feel like, first off, there's the puppets. Uh, there's sort of the 80s green throwback mutants. Uh, but most of all, I think it's... Uh... I mean, this is sort of a, a satire of those genres in a way. It's a subtle satire, but it's it's definitely there. And I feel like, you know, this does deal with a lot of the same themes as, as other post-apocalyptic fiction. Like, you know, how, how far will you go to protect the ones you love and things like that definitely come into play. Well, it sounds pretty cool. Thank you, Maxwell, for joining me today for this Jumpstart interview. There will be links to the Kickstarter page for Dead Meat in the description. Do you have any connections like Facebook, Twitter, that people can use to keep track of yourself as well as the project? Uh, sure. I'm Maxwell Adams on Facebook. Uh, Dead Meat is Dead Meat Series on Facebook. And I am Grim Unicorn on Twitter. And I've got my own Maxwell Adams YouTube channel now. I think that it, I think that's one of the best Twitter names I've heard in quite a while. Well, yeah, somebody somebody took my real name, so there is a Maxwell <laughs> Adams, but it's not me. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again for joining. Is there anything you would like to say or say either about yourself or the show before we finish the interview? Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I hope people come out and back it. Uh, even if you don't know where I came from when you, you've never heard of Billy and Mandy in your life, uh, go check out Dead Meat on Kickstarter. Uh, let me know what you think. Thank you again, Maxwell, for talking to me today, and thank you, viewers, for watching and listening. Links to all of these contacts, as well as the Kickstarter page, will be in the description of the video. It's all nice in one spot for those of you viewing. Please do go and check it out, as Kickstarter projects cannot exist without your support. This has been another Jumpstart interview. I've made a pie man talking to Maxwell Adams for Dead Meat, and I will talk to you guys later.